wherever you are in the world, uh, good day to you. It's an honor to be invited to participate in this uh, web event. This is the way we do things now, unfortunately, due to COVID, but uh, that way uh, we're, we're all together on the same page and, and we can decrease our carbon footprint a little bit because mine has been very, very big for almost 30 years. What do I do at Sorbonne University? My position is Director of International Development, so I work very closely with the President the Vice President for International and Europe and the other Vice Presidents, especially those concerned with uh, education and research and corporate development as well. I'm here to implement the international strategy decided by the President and also in an advisory role as well. So there's a lot of diplomacy that happens around Sorbonne University, as you can imagine. So I'm here to help out in that kind of a role. I'm in charge of the development of the strategic international partnerships of the university, in charge of the overseas ventures, for example, the strategic supervision of Sorbonne University Abu Dhabi. And we also have a venture with a couple of French partners in China, which is uh, the Indo, or the uh, French Chinese, Sino-French Institute in uh, Suzhou with Renmin University. I take care of international communications with my team, all of the branding and marketing for Sorbonne Worldwide. We help out with corporate and alumni relationships, all the representation. And then of course, we, we help strategize on how to improve all issues around incoming and outgoing international mobility, whether it be for faculty, staff, or students. So that's what I do on a daily basis. It's not easy right now, but we'll talk about that a little, little bit later due to the pandemic. In terms of the second part of the question, which was how do we use internationalization to improve our performance in education, research, and engagement? I was taught very, very early. I was brought up very, very early through the higher education system and international development. This is what I've been doing for three decades. First and foremost, we'll put it on the table, internationalization improves us. Internationalization improves us. We are in internationalization in the business of emulation, benchmarking, looking at best practices, I'll always remember, you know, my bosses in the early part of my career, when they would travel abroad, they would come back with a very long list of ideas that they had seen elsewhere. And that was something that I caught on to very early. And so I learned how to bring back good ideas. We get advice from our partners as well. We exchange ideas. So in a nutshell, internationalization improves us and it just depends on what we do with it, how we strategize about it, and how we implement it in our uni universities and put the means behind it to succeed. Now, specifically in terms of education, and this, for those of you who are in the higher education space, you'll recognize this uh, very quickly, in terms of teaching the benefits of internationalization that we can immediately identify is, of course, everything to do with mobility. It's student mobility, so we're creating futures for young people. We're creating worldly graduates. We are not creating graduates just for the local country, but for the world. And more and more companies, as you know, or other types of employers, international organizations, universities themselves, <laughs> They want young graduates who are operational to work worldwide immediately after graduation. It's not like in the old days where they had to wait till they were practically 40 and be transferred from Paris to Hong Kong to work with the whole family, etc. They want to send 25 year olds to Hong Kong to work. So we create worldly graduates, we create mixed classrooms full of nationalities. We have about 70 nationalities here at Sorbonne, if it's not more. And this creates a very eclectic uh, atmosphere for the students to be sitting next to students from all over the world, just in terms of internationalization at home. We create joint courses with partners, blended learning, sometimes some virtual, we'll talk about that, some in in real life, let's call it. 
new curriculum design with our partners to enrich the different uh, curricula that we have by pulling on the strengths of our different partners to to create a more original program, include other languages, other cultural perspectives. And then in terms of faculty mobility, it keeps our professors on their toes with renewed energy to go abroad or to receive colleagues from around the world and to bring in, like I say, new pedagogical ideas, new program ideas, new ways of teaching, new vision. In terms of research, well, international collaborations are part of our DNA in many institutions across Europe. We have colleagues in other countries around the world in universities where they would cringe at the idea of doing co-publications because for some of them, it means that if they go out and get foreign help, it might be because they didn't have the expertise and the knowledge in their own shop. Well, Sorbonne is one of Europe's biggest co-publishers internationally. I think we're top five, depending on the ranking of the day or the stats of the day. And we fully believe in the benefits of collaborating with people in one other country or in several countries to produce uh, research output for the betterment of the world. We have a European university, for example, uh, dedicated to education, but also the alliance around that European university is dedicated to research, deep and less deep, uh, but in a multidisciplinary way and looking across cultures. So it brings new talent to a topic. We open the opportunities for researchers and uh, in terms of information and discoveries, it gives way to new emblematic projects, the creation of joint institutes, for example, with our partners worldwide, new sources of funding. So we all like more money <laughs> and often partnering with the, an international institution can bring more funding because we put in 100,000, they put in 100,000. That's 200,000 we can do things with for the benefit of everyone. And then, of course, through research, new opportunities for students at all levels, better research, better teaching. And finally, to finish off on this question, in terms of engagement, we engage internationally and through our internationalization process with our alumni. So we say that the, a, a good alumni, is, a good alum is created by us. And the contact starts from the very first instant that we are in touch with a potential student in France or on the other side of the world. And it's very important for us to follow that student from the, the very first contact till after he or she graduates and beyond to make sure that we nourish that talent, to make sure that talent finds employability and of course keeps contact with us throughout the years and helps the little ones coming up behind them. We engage also through corporate relationships. We engage through corporate relationships with French companies. So for example, we were recently in Mexico in the day before COVID, I mean, literally beginning of March, we had 15 faculty members and a couple of administrators in Mexico City. We were working with our partner there, UNAM, on various research topics and pedagogical topics. And we met with uh, about a dozen companies from France and from Mexico who are interested in what we're doing with UNAM and who want to see what kind of synergies can be created, both on the research level, but also helping the young people by providing internships for them, providing jobs. And many times the corporate relationships result in hiring the young people that we train either from Mexico in France, who speak French, who speak English and have been trained elsewhere, but also the French who, for whichever reason, they might want to hire for their knowledge of Europe and to integrate their teams locally. So that in a nutshell is how we see internationalization.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. This is a, a, a very good overview for all these activities, but we know and we discussed that the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, uh, you know, changed the course of history and that probably generated or certainly generated some structural changes also for your daily activity. So uh, we are interested uh, to discuss with you what are the main changes that you face uh, daily now in your work but also what are you the things that you you think are changed forever the the structural changes that uh, were brought about by this uh, virus thank you Gris. Sure. i was closing my eyes half early because I, I don't know if i believe in forever i don't think i want to believe in forever <laughs> Uh, I fully agree with changes and, and doing things better and learning from this uh, unprecedented experience, at least in, in our lifetime. But how have I been doing my job with my team for the last few months now and how are we doing it? Well, first of all, somebody like me, I've been traveling 40, 45 percent of my professional time sometimes 50% of my professional time for 25 years, something like that. A week in the States, back to France, off to Hong Kong and mainland China, down to Brazil, back to Europe. And now we're not going anywhere. Now that's a big change. And we're on video now. So, I was sitting in the yard, in the garden, when, you know, in the thick of uh, COVID-19, the month of April, which was, I call it, hell month for COVID, because we didn't know where we were going, where we were going with all of this. And I made a list of the fears and questions that uh, I had for somebody in my position and with a team and with responsibilities to the university. And I knew that journalists or webinar people from OECD would, would start asking questions like this. And the many questions that we asked were, you know, how are we going to keep moving with our partners? We're used to getting to know the partner a bit by email or, or through grassroots research that's been done for years, going over to see them, working with them, coming back, then they visit us and we move forward like that in a series of visits. Well, here we are on the screen with microphones and so on and so forth. So it's quite a bit different. Will our partners still consider Sorbonne to be a priority? Will partners still consider internationalization a priority in this mess? If you look at partners in some parts of the world who are dependent on the dollar and incoming international students, they've been hurt. They've been hurt badly. Look at Australia. 30-40% of their university budgets came from international students. They've lost hundreds of millions. So there were a lot of questions. Now, I can reassure everyone by saying that I'm relieved. We are all relieved here. Our vice president and I, president, we've discussed this a lot. We sent out letters to all of our partners, everyone we work with, and said, hey, you know, we're in this hopefully temporary, very temporary situation. Here's what we suggest we do in order to move forward with our partnerships and other activities that we have. Do you agree? And we waited. And luckily the response was very, very positive. So we've gone completely virtual now. We're working with our partner universities. We're creating corporate relationships. We're helping to manage Sorbonne Abu Dhabi at a distance and our institute in China. We have all of the, the official meetings, just like you do, the conferences and the networking that we all know and love and sometimes love to hate. I mean, luckily, our good friends at Times Higher Education, for example, pulled off a marvelous World Summit, their annual event, which is top dialogue through the web. It's helped us create a new approach to our meetings. And this, Rafaela, is, is something I hope will remain intact. It's a new approach. We're more focused on our objectives. Before it was, okay, how do I get 18 people in an airplane to Mexico City 
<laughs> you know, uh, get them off the plane, make sure they're well taken care of, get the meetings done, get some sort of a conclusion, uh, you know, figure out the funding and move forward. Whereas since we're all here, all of that is much more fluid and the partners are more available as well. And so we get around the screen. Now everything has to be smaller. We don't put up as many people. Everything is more focused. Uh, the key players are available, as I said, which is very good. The other top opportunity uh, is that when we do start to travel again, we will use these virtual means, at least I'm convinced of it, more to get to know one another before we start spending thousands of euros and, and uh, pushing up our carbon footprint to, to travel somewhere. We will be more prepared for the meetings. The getting to know you phase will be done. And when we hit the ground, we can hit the ground running and perhaps initiate projects faster and get them up to a running stage in a more timely fashion, because there is a lot of time in, from the old days, pre-COVID, when you know the getting to know you was a big chunk of taking people abroad. So I'm looking forward to that being part of it. And then the name of the game in our business too is follow-up. When you do go abroad and you come back, if you don't follow up immediately, you know, and keep things rolling then the, the project can die. It can die a very early death. So I think everybody's used to these virtual means now and we will have a better follow-up and face-to-face -face is really good if we, if we can't, uh, we won't be dependent on email for that anymore. And finally, with our partners, we've looked at new forms of blended mobility for our students. So the projects I talk about are mostly research-based, but there's also the blended mobility that we're looking at. We're talking uh, to partners about global classrooms. For example, students can start working together here uh, alone, you know, with their own cohort, then work with the team in Australia or in the United States or elsewhere through virtual means. And then if the situation allows us, perhaps they can meet up either in France or, or at the other end of the world. The virtual workshops have opened up events, research events to more people because the budget is so low. This is a positive as well. So this form of working, I'm sure it, it, it pushed that forward. Um, all, everything virtual will keep us on our toes, keep things moving forward. Now, the challenge remains is that I don't care what anybody says. You know, they say, Chris, you know, you're not traveling as much and it's tough with the partnerships because you can't go see them. So you have to do things differently. But I say, well, differently, yes, but differently has its limits. Because frankly, in this business, I don't care what anybody says, um, in real life, IRL is still better. We're in the relationship business. We need to see people. We need to eat together, have a drink together, uh, hypothesize, strategize, uh, philosophize together in order to move our projects forward. So differently has its limits, especially when we're talking about negotiations as well of new projects or with entities that are, are holding the, the purse strings for, for projects, etc. Let's see where it goes, but that's my viewpoint right now. Thank you very much, Christopher, for this uh, very detailed and practical answer. And I'm sure that uh, most participants uh, fully agree with you. Um, so now for the third question before a Q&A, we would like to discuss uh, a little bit uh, uh, the kind of support or guidance that national or even supranational entities and governments, there are many participants from Europe, so think about the EU, for instance. So what kind of support they can offer to higher education institution to help them and guide them in developing uh, internationalization strategies and activities. What can you tell us about this? Well, I've had some very strong views on this type of subject for quite a while. I would just like to preface what I'm going to say by saying that I fully believe in the independence of higher education institutions and that the state doesn't need to be pouncing on us with rules and regulations all of the time, and that we should be allowed to carry out our international strategies if we have one in the manner which we see fit. Now, 
That said, I really, really admire what the UK government pulled off just before summer, I believe it was. They named Sir Steve Smith, the former VC of the University of Exeter, as the UK's first international education champion. I call him the international education czar. And I love that idea. I almost tweeted that we need one of those for France. But then I thought, oh boy, I want to be careful about political things. But then I met with my old boss who, who works for somebody very well placed in the government. And uh, he said, no, you should have tweeted that <laughs> because he agrees completely. The aim of Steve's role is to boost overseas activities, promote new partnerships, develop tighter collaboration across government departments on international education policy. I'm sure people come from many countries today in this webinar and, you know, here in France, I won't go naming names of ministries or I'll get myself in trouble, but we have a few who are involved in education, higher education, and they're not always coordinated. Depending on the project, we talk better with one about it than the other and so on and so forth. And more coordination would be good. Now, more countries need a prominent higher education person in such a role. It will help them to hone their strategy of internationalization. There are a lot of places in the world where they're struggling. I see Nishit Jain on my screen from India and he knows exactly what I'm talking about. He and I put together a major project in India over several years. We went to three different ministries and entities to get very crucial information for our project to set up an Ecole Centrale there. And we got three different answers to the different questions. India has been struggling to internationalize its higher education for ages. And they're trying, they're trying very hard. France, UK, other European nations, we do okay in internationalization, but often we're not sure exactly if we're going in the right direction. And many, uh, in, in many institutions have no international strategy which has been written out, approved by the Board of Trustees of the university, and have a team in place to execute it with the proper budget. So international strategies and objectives can vary from country to country. Many have no international strategy whatsoever. We appreciate the independence of higher education institutions worldwide, but many need guidance, they need targets, they need diplomatic support and different types of expertise to move forward. And many governments could equip themselves with experts to do that. Now, that's the strategic level. Also, there's the cash. <laughs> it's great to put an international strategy in place. But if you don't have the funding to move forward, and I'm talking significant funding to move forward on emblematic and flagship level projects with international partners or with foreign governments, etc., just forget it. You can't do proper international development on a shoestring. You must do international development at the level that your funding will allow and with realistic goals and objectives in terms of your partnering power, with whom can you partner, in terms of with whom you want your students to do mobility, with whom you'd like to do research, who shares your values, etc. So to finish on funding, we have the Excellence Initiative here in France, and that provides quite a bit of funding to what we do here at Sorbonne in terms of our international development. And that amount of money is over and above the regular budget, the regular budget of Sorbonne. So 
It's what we call soft money, but allows us to do many things from hiring people to putting in very cutting edge projects. Thank you, Christopher. Did you want to share anything else with us? Oh, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> that was my answer. <laughs> I was wondering whether I was having a connection issue or, you know, I was no, no, sorry, I should have but... moved, but uh, I didn't freeze. You know? <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for this very detailed answer. And I saw that Raphael in the chat box ha already highlighted policy complementarities when you mentioned about, you know, the lack of coordination across ministries sometimes. And I'm sure that Raphael, I will be happy to get back to this after the Q&A. But now, I mean, I see that some questions are coming, so I will immediately give the floor to Anne and Maria for questions and answers. Hello, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who sort of contributed to the chat and, and encourage others to, to please add more in uh, because we sort of try to bring them together to some questions. So the first question I, I thought I'd, I'd start with is, uh, and you referenced sort of big decreases in demand for, of international students in this sort of COVID year, that having big impacts on uh, the budgets for HEIs in, in countries like Australia. And I guess my, my question is, how optimistic can we be that the, demand, that the international student demand will return to where it was? And that sort of uh, the prestige that uh, the Anglo-Saxon world, that Europe's been able to hold to attract students globally will, uh, will re-emerge sort of post-COVID. We have very smart young people in the world and we have companies who need them to be internationalized and be operational to work worldwide. This is a globalized market. I firmly do not believe that international mobility for students is dead or near dead. I think I've been asked that question a hundred times and I will always give the same answer. International mobility changes lives. I don't care if the kid goes abroad for a week or a year. It changed my life and I'm still living my dream. People say, don't you want to work abroad? I say, but I already do. And I won't give it up. So I firmly believe that international mobility will snap back. However, I, I mean, some of it's an administrative problem. France is open. France is open for business, but you know, we've got visa issues, backlogs, people who couldn't get their files through. I'm not criticizing anybody, it's normal. You know, we just don't have the teams in place to process all of the backlog. So that's just part of being in a pandemic, right? So they're going to keep coming as long as the doors are open. They're going to go where they can go. Now, students are going to start being maybe even smarter about their mobility choices. Where will they decide to go? And there's been a lot of ink that's been poured over pages about maybe choosing their destination in terms of how well the country handled the pandemic, as opposed to just choosing a university off one of the hit parades that we all know. I mean, one of the, one of the rankings, which is often the way, uh, unfortunately, we, we choose the university we go to. Uh, target country, yeah, I want to go to the States. Yeah, I want top 10. Yeah, okay, fine. Well, maybe they're going to have different criteria, maybe families are going to start saying, hey, you know, you might not want to go there because this is the way they handled COVID and so forth and so on. So it's going to be a smarter decision, a deeper decision, and maybe there won't be such a rush to want to go abroad too quickly. Many students are now realizing that, hey, here in China, we've got some really good quality internationalized programs. Maybe I don't need to go abroad. Maybe I'll do a couple of years at home and then I'll go abroad, uh, you know, etc. This is what's happening. I mean, we've seen the development of the higher education sector in, in China. I mean, I remember going to China 20, 20 something years ago. And, whew, you know, it was tough in terms of quality. Now they're beating us all to a pulp in the international rankings. So I see it moving forward. It'll just, you know, take some time to get it back to the right level. Thank you. I think it's Georgia who's gonna ask the next question. Yes, hello. Thank you so much, uh, Christopher, for, for uh, the insights. Uh, another question um, uh, that we see is uh, about university rankings. So we know that um, 
there are different benchmark marks that uh, universities and higher institutions are um, are held upon and um, we just wanted to know um, uh, your opinion on these on the criteria on based on which universities and higher educations are are ranked and how how will this develop going forward also because some of this criteria doesn't um, uh, might might omit you know the the higher institution and uh, its impact on its community. I'll try to be very brief on rankings because we could do a whole new session about it <laughs> with lots of very violent opinions. I'm afraid. I once had a, a boss who had a wonderful saying. He said, "There are only two kinds of rankings." the ones in which we are well ranked and the ones that aren't serious. <laughs> I love it. I use that frequently. The criteria are very different across the big three. Shanghai ranking, um, which is the, you know, the, the one out of Shanghai, the AWRU, uh, the uh, Times Higher Education, and uh, QS, for example. And then there are others which are struggling a little bit, <laughs> but who knows, you know, there's, I call it, what's the ranking of the day? You know, everybody's got to come up with a ranking. And then the rankers rank so many things. You know, I said, we're going to start ranking the color of our ties soon. I mean, it gets a little bit ridiculous. Everything is ranked now. So the criteria are different from ranking to ranking. Universities should not have a nervous breakdown if they are like we are, you know, we're 39th ish or something like that in the Shanghai ranking. We're number 86 in the Times Higher Education ranking or something like that. Different criteria, different moments in time, etc. Now, we're still Sorbonne. No matter what our ranking of the day is, if you break things down, we're number two in the world in mathematics, we're in the top 10 in different social sciences, et cetera, et cetera. So you can look at that as well in terms of the disciplinary breakdown in the various rankings. So in terms of, however, your question was about mobility and how that impacts reputation, Georgia, is that it? Yes? Yes, sorry, <laughs> yes. Um, it is true that the better ranked a university is, the more students are paying attention. I mean, I can remember back in my Grenoble Ecole de Management days, the minute our program, our Master in International Business became ranked top 10 in Europe, 75% of the marketing was done. So yes, that does have a big impact. It is great for visibility. But we'll have many other experts who could speak better to the subject than I can in terms of their criteria and what it really means. But at the end of the day, our, our biggest objective is to produce excellence, the highest level we can possibly produce with the means that we have at our disposal, with the brain power and talent that we have at our disposal and the rankings at Sorbonne, we don't do anything special to be in the rankings, except produce excellence. This is not a technical problem. I think that's, that's a great way to, that's, that's a great tagline. Um, I think it's Maria up next with uh, the last of the three questions. Where's Maria? Yes. Maria? Here. Hi. Oh, Sorry. there you are. Hi. Okay. <laughs> for them, so my camera keeps uh, switching on and off. But we had a last question that we picked up from the chat. And thank you very much for your insights also. Is that as we transition, uh, like you were saying, to a virtual uh, teaching model, blended teaching model, what consequences do you foresee on university budget? And how would you reuse the budget, uh, the budget intended to internationalization activities? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, for many uh, circumstances, there's a lot of money we're not spending because of COVID. 
I mean, my travel budget hasn't moved <laughs> very much, and it's quite, quite consequential. All of the money we were going to put into having people travel around the world to develop partnerships and attend conferences, well, it's still there. So now that means that we have these funds available to do something else. I mean, if you're in, an, in a liberal enough uh, jurisdiction or legislation to where you can move money across your budget any way you can, which is our case, thank goodness. Uh, some people cannot, and we have issues with that in other places. But uh, we're starting to channel the funding from what we can't do to what we should be doing and what we could be doing. So the money is being funneled into creating pilot projects for blended learning. In other words, virtual my colleagues here don't like the word virtual mobility, but for, for all intents and purposes, that's what it is. So creating other types of opportunities for students, creating online courses, creating virtual mobility for staff and for faculty as well, for paying for all of the things that COVID has caused us to have to purchase. Um, creating MOOCs, all of that. So the money is being funneled to other types of activities. It's not just sitting there uh, doing nothing, that's for sure. Now, all of us international people have to be very careful. When we do start being able to travel again and all of that, make sure you get all your budget back because we'll be back in our real business. And I firmly believe that we'll be there uh, in time. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So those were the kind of main questions we, we had. So I'll pass the, the microphone back to, to Raffaele and Julia. Thank you all very much for your questions. And if you'd like to continue the debate, uh, feel free to, 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 to join me on LinkedIn. I'm there, Christopher Cripps, my real name. And uh, I'm also on Twitter. So it's C underscore Crips, C-R-I-P-P-S, C underscore Crips. And I love to tweet with colleagues about all these subjects on a daily basis. So th thank you very much, Chris. It was, a, it was a great discussion. I don't know if Julia wants to add something before we wrap up are almost over so Raffaele please go ahead I just let me thank you uh, once again Christopher for the very interesting uh, opinions and ideas you shared with us also on a topic that perhaps we covered a bit less throughout the series so it was really a great uh, uh, a great session well many yeah. thanks to all of you this was very engaging and it was uh, it was an honor to be able to share opinions and I say opinions it's just experience really and sort of telling you what we're what we're living through and what reality is and whether you agree with everything I say is or not is absolutely fine it's just uh, just experience thank you very much Christopher because uh, as, as Julia said this is an area in which we need to develop uh, more intelligence more you know uh, knowledge to understand how internationalization can be pivotal yeah. for our engagement, oh, the work on engagement, on the geography of higher education, on the connection with ecosystems and network. What is evident is that, uh, as you said, now th people have to think about internationalization. Before, you know, university uh, internationalization was, were almost uh, synonyms. Now the, there is a need for a more strategic approach to internationalization in order to reboot the machine in order to put things uh, not where they were uh, before, because it's impossible, but in a new equilibrium that is sustainable, makes sense, uh, generates excellence uh, and uh, skills that match the need at the international level. And I liked very much your point about the czar that you need for internationalization, because uh, you know it's bionivocal. On the one hand, uh, autonomous higher education institutions would probably benefit from this service from a national entity helping them find out what could be their impact 
at the international level and what internationalization could be for, for, for them. And also generating all those complementarities, those linkages, synergies between different policies that can generate, uh, you know, a better impact or, or a better on, on research, on innovation, on a better connection between universities and uh, external stakeholders. Uh, more in general, I would say that uh, it is important also to consider that higher education institutions will be fundamental in the future, especially in the regeneration, in the recovery period, to steer investment towards sustainability and inclusion because they represent a reservoir of intelligence, data, knowledge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So complementary complementarities will not only benefit higher education institutions, but will also benefit the central czar that can have uh, more information about policy, good policy making, evidence-based policy making. Chris, well, the uh, last word is yours. No, and I was going to say, and let's all, in, in that vein, uh, Rafael, let's all say kudos to universities. I mean, we're very involved, other universities have been very involved in producing research to help get us out of this mess that we've got ourselves into. So, you know, this is part of it. Universities are on the front line to help get us out of COVID-19 and the pandemic. I think we need to realize that as well. And many of uh, the activities that are going on are international. They're going on today in our laboratories, uh, just uh, a few feet from my office. Uh, to, to help save the world from, from this situation. We need to be aware of that. So, 